Hello, graduating class of 2019. Congratulations. Welcome to all of you. I'm Carol Becker, Dean of the School of the Arts. I would like to bring out the Columbia University Jazz Ensemble to take a bow. Where are they? Thank you so much. They've played for so many of our graduations. Here we are. Welcome, welcome to a graduating class of 2019, to parents, to friends, faculty and staff, to our interim, interim EVP for Arts and Sciences, Maya Tolstoy, who is in the audience today, and of course to our graduation speaker, the dynamic, brilliant, fabulous, artistic director of the public theater, Askis Eustis. It is a daring experiment and a leap of faith to come to art school, trusting above all else in the importance of one's own creativity and of its power to transform society while believing that time spent at Columbia University will be essential to this process and one's ability to navigate the worlds of visual art, sound, theater, writing, and film. So let us all first congratulate the class of 2019 for its boundless courage, originality, boldness, and conviction. You have all worked extremely hard and achieved so much already. In the last weeks, all the school's programs have been enlivened by end of the year shows, exhibitions, performances, festivals, and publications. We thank you, our students, for your brilliantly directed, acted, conceptualized, managed, and produced Columbia New Plays Festival and the Directors and Actors, Actors Thesis Productions. The beautifully written and designed Writer's Thesis Anthology. The monumental visual arts and sound art thesis exhibition held for the, th held for the third. <laughs> held for the third time at the Lenfest Center for the Arts, the astounding week of scholarly thesis presentations, new short films, screenplays, and television writing by our incredibly accomplished filmmakers and scholars at Lincoln Center, the Lenfest Center for the Arts, and the Directors Guild of America. The graduating class this year is comprised of students from most states in the United States and from 29 other countries, and we cherish this national and global breadth that so reflects the spirit of the 21st century and enriches the education of us all. We all learn about cultural and social difference from each other and create collaborations and friendships that can last a lifetime. Because we have bonded with you as students, fellow artists, scholars, and colleagues, we are very sad to see you leave, but we are also very excited, confident that we have prepared you well. <laughs> now you have me blushing. <laughs> we have prepared you well. <laughs> um, confident uh, that you will be able to enter your various professions and push the boundaries of form and invent new ones along the way. Each year at graduation, I take some time, sometimes too much time, to revel in the accomplishments of our alumni and faculty. And I believe this is important to give you, our graduates, and especially your families, confidence that your departure from the school is really only the beginning of many amazing successes to come. These highlights really are a fraction of a fraction of all that has been accomplished by our alumni and faculty in the past year. So I'm gonna just start with film. Green Book, directed and co-written by writing alumnus Peter Farrelly, won three Oscars, including Best Motion Picture. Ralph Breaks the Internet, the 3D Disney animation, co-directed and co-written by film alumnus Phil Johnston, was nominated for a Golden Globe. 
37 Columbia alumni and faculty, including writers, directors, producers, cinematographers, and post-supervisors premiered films at Sundance, and four films took home awards, including Green, a short directed and co-written by alumna Suzanne Correa and Mustafa Kaimak. Five alumni, as well as current student Nahir Tuna, were all selected for the Sundance Screenwriters Lab. The director's fortnight section of the 2019 Cannes Film Festival selected two features by Columbia alumni, Cancion Sin Nombre, Song Without a Name, by Melina Leon, and Hue J. Chang To Live to Sing, by recent grad Johnny Ma. 32 alumni, faculty, and students screened films at South by Southwest. This year took home some top prizes, including South Mountain, written and directed by faculty and chair Hilary Brocker with a team of alumni. <laughs> Recent alumna Bora Kim wrote and directed House of Hummingbird, which won the grand prize at the Berlini International Film Festival. It also won Best Cinematography, Best Actress, and Best International Feature Film at Tribeca Film Festival, as well as the Golden Tulip, the top prize at the, prize at the 38th Istanbul Film Festival. Alumni Rory Haynes and Sorab Noshivani were nominated in BAFTA's drama series category for an Informer, and Dan Kogan was nominated in BAFTA's international category for producing Reporting Trump's First Year, The Fourth Estate. Writer-director alumni Zach Morrison and producer Taylor Ortega won the 39th College Television Award for their comedy Everything's Fine, A Panic Attack in D, in D Major. And Combat Obscura, a behind-the-scenes documentary of military combat in Afghanistan, shot and directed by film and media studies undergraduate and Marine veteran Miles Lagos premiered this spring despite very many external efforts to suppress the film. It was edited by MFA alumnus Eric Schumann and the film also won Columbia College's annual Sudler Prize. The MA in Film and Media Studies, spearheaded by Xing Zhen Xuan, past and current MA students launched the Chine China Film Festival at the SVA Theater and Symphony Space where they screened 20 films. Many of our MA graduates have gone on to excellent PhD programs. Next year, Zhu Jingzhou will enter the PhD program at University of Toronto, and Xiao Hong Ten will begin his doctoral studies at Harvard. Faculty member Nico Bombach published, uh, published Cinema Politics Criticism from Columbia University Press. Faculty Rob King delivered the King's College Key Scholars in Film Studies lecture at the British Institute. In London, Professor Jane Gaines delivered a prestigious lecture for the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences based on her book, Pink Slipped, What Happened to Women in the Silent Film Industries? And the book was then honored by a choice outstanding academic award. Theater. Theater professor David Henry Wong was inducted into the Theater Hall of Fame. A number of alumni received recognition from the Tony Awards. This year, Hadestown, directed by alumna Rachel Chavkin, leads the musical category with 14 nominations, including Best Musical. <laughs> what the Constitution Means to Me received two nominations, including Best Play, T Fellows Aaron Glick, Rachel Sussman, and alumni John Bierman, Tatiana Pandini, and Danielle Carlina all worked on the production. Usual Girls, written by alumna Ming Pfeiffer and directed by alumna Tyne Raffaelli received a Drama Desk nomination for both Outstanding Play and Outstanding Direction of a Play, and faculty member Lynn Nottage also received several Drama Desk, drama desk nominations. Many alumni landed TV and film roles. Alumni Ito Akayer joined the cast of CBS comedy pilots Carol's Second Act. David Fierro became a series regular in the new CBS drama Tommy, acting alumnus David Wilson Barnes, will join the cast of the production, Inc. Alumna Heather Alicia Sims appeared in By the Way, Meet Vera Stark, written by faculty member Lynn Nottage, and alumna Kate Trevett starred in the short films Girl Talk and Ice Cold. I'm going to keep going. Many theater alumni gained new leadership roles this year. Christopher Burney was named artistic director of New York Stage and Film. Alumna Piron <laughs> Youssef Zaya became the director of engagement and associate artistic director at the Geva Theater Center. The Human Race Theater Company appointed alumna Catherine Kilburn as executive director, theater and management alumni Eric Keen Louis 
became the producing director of La Jolla Playhouse, while Brandon Kahn was named general manager for the Alley Theater in Houston, and Aaron Sims became general manager of the, of the York Theater Company, and alumnus Bo Williman, House of Cards showrunner, premiered his new series, The First, on Hulu. Visual arts. 24 Columbia artists, including five faculty, um, one current student, and 18 alumni showcased their work at the 2018 Art Basel in Miami, Florida. Faculty member Sarah Z had her first Italian solo gallery exhibition at Gagosian in Rome following her 2013 American Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Faculty member Lisa Mixon and Sheila Pepe had site-specific installation in BAM's Next Wave art exhibition. Alumna Patrice Aphrodite Helmar presented a site-specific installation at the Skirt in Gowanus, while alumna Heidi Howard had a large exhibition at the Queens Museum. Alumna Katsi Bestard had her first solo show at Ulterior Gallery. Alumna Dana Schutz had a solo exhibition at Petzl Gallery. Alumna Emily May Smith had a solo exhibition with Le Consortium. Esteban Cabeza de Baca had his first solo exhibition at Boers Lee and was then featured in the New York Times as one of four artists to watch now. Alumna Sandra Perry was named the ninth winner of the Nam June Pike Award. Jeffrey Maris was one of the winners of the 35th Annual Central Bank of Bahamas Art Competition. Mentor Ralph Lemon was awarded the prestigious and very lucrative Heinz Award in the Arts and Humanities category. Kian Williams, Asif Mian, and, and Hugh Hayes were all selected for commissions by the new Visual and Performing Arts Center, The Shed. And several visual arts premiered work in film. 306 Hollywood, a feature by alumnus Jonathan Bagaran, had its world premiere at Sundance in 2018 and was released this fall. Recent alumni ba Ami Rivlin produced a short, The Prayer, which <laughs> premiered at New Fest, New York's LGBT film festival. Sound Art, director of, Sound Art, pro of the Sound Art program, faculty Mia Masayoka, was the Park Avenue Armory studio artist for 2019, where she premiered her new opera, The Long Arc of Time. Kamari Carter will be attending... <laughs> will be attending the Audio Italia Residency in Barcelona. Lee Gib Gilboa will be attending IRA, IR IRCOM in Paris and later a PhD at Brown. And Mig Tai Zhang will participate in the Bai City Biennale of Urbanism and Architecture in Shenzhen, China, and later will be attending the PhD program at Rensselaer Polytechnic. And alumnus Lemon Guo will become a Headland Center for the Art Fellow, while alumnus Ethan Edwards had been named researcher in experiments in art and technology at Nokia Bell Labs. Okay, moving on to writing. We're almost there. The debut novel. <laughs> The debut novel by alumnus Malcolm Hansen, They Come in All Colors, was awarded the 2019 First Novelist Award from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. He was also nominated for an NAACP Award for Outstanding Literature. American a Spy by alumna Lauren Wilkinson was released. She also was named a writer to watch by Publishers Weekly. Wonderland, a new novel by fiction alumna Jennifer Cody Epstein was published. The Mars Room by alumna Rachel Kushner was named Best Book of 2018 by the New York Times and shortlisted for the 2018 Man Booker Prize. Writing chair Sam Lipside's novel, Hark, was released to terrific praise. Adjunct faculty Sigrid Nunez won the National Book Award for The Friend. Your Duck is My Duck by faculty member Deborah Eisenberg was named a Best Book by both New York Times and Book Forum and the Paris Review presented Deborah Eisenberg with the 2019 Hadada Award for Lifetime Achievement. Many recent alums in, alumni in fiction and poetry released newer first books this year. Sam Charles Ross, among them, debuted his collection of poetry that also was selected as the winner of the Four Ways book, Levis Prize in Poetry. And current student journalist and activist, Orla Tinsley, was awarded a President's Medal in Ireland. Tinsley was also the subject of the documentary Oral Tinsley Warrior, a film that chronicles her personal and amazing struggle with cystic fibrosis and her lung transplant journey. Alumna Rachel Kadzi Gansa received the American Mosaic Journalist Prize. Director of Literary Translation Susan Bernofsky won the Ulfers Prize, the Modern Language Association Lewis, <laughs> Lewis Roth Prize, and with faculty Ben Marcus and Mitchell S. Jackson, the Coleman Center Fellows Award by the New York Public Library. Writing and Translation alumni Katrine Ogard Jensen won the 2018 National Translation Award in Poetry from the American Literary Translators Association. Alumnus Simon Lesser won the Penn America Translation Grant. 
alumna Alexander Watson will receive the Penn Nora Magid Award as the editor of, of Apogee, a journal of literature and art. <laughs> Foregrounding writers, uh, artists, um, writers of color and issues of race, gender, and class. And poet and classicist Aaron Puchigan won the Richard Wilbur Poetry Award. Alumna Jennifer Sears received a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship in Prose and Artist Fellowship in Fiction from the New York Foundation for the Arts. Poetry faculty Shane McRae received a Guggenheim. Faculty Richard Ford won the Library of Congress Award for American Fiction. And alumna Tracy K. Smith, Poet Laureate of the United States, received the Harvard Arts Medal. <laughs> And that's just a fraction. School of the Arts alumni and faculty are everywhere successful, and in a short time, you, the class of 2019, will become part of this illustrious group. Please remember to stay close to us and to tell us what you are up to. No one, except for your friends and family, will ever be as proud of you, excited about your work and success as we will. Speaking of families, Let's acknowledge those without whom many of you would never have completed this most essential part of your development as artists. Will the family and friends of all of our graduates please stand? We have so outgrown our space at Miller that we have live feed rooms, so I'd like to acknowledge those families and friends who are in our live feed room upstairs as well. Now a moment to thank the faculty. I would venture to say that there is no more devoted and successful faculty anywhere in the world than ours. All working artists of many forms, they nonetheless give so much of their imagination and their wisdom to their students. Testimony to their extraordinary commitment is that in the last 11 years, our faculty have won the Presidential Out Outstanding Teaching Award six times more than any other school at Columbia University. Now let's ask our faculty present to please stand and be acknowledged by the students and colleagues. Just a few more thank yous and then we'll move on. Um, my team, it really takes our entire team to make graduation possible. So let me thank in particular, Layla Mayer, Dean of Students, Jeffrey James Keyes. <laughs> Jeffrey James Keyes, Assistant Director of Student Affairs. Taylor Riccio, Director of Production Operation here at Miller Theater. Peter Vaughn, Director of Instructional <laughs> Information. <laughs> I know he makes it happen for so many of you. Um, Christina Rump, Director of Communications. There are also three theater students who stage manage this event, or two, stage manage this event, Dennis Ho and... <laughs> and and Teo Kang. You know, when I first came to be dean, I thought graduation didn't look so good. And I said, well, we've got this fantastic theater program. Why don't we ask them to organize us? <laughs> and every year now they do, and every year I think we look pretty good. Um, I want to thank uh, also the Interdisciplinary Arts Council. Um, would the students from the Interdisciplinary Arts Council who are here today please stand? I want to thank them for being a mainstay. <laughs> They really help so much, they give so much to the school, and they really, really learn a lot about leadership, I think, in the process. So I also need to thank my office, everybody. I would like to thank the directors of academic administration, Sarah Mason in film, Laura, El <laughs> Laura Elmore in theater, Carrie Gundersdorf, <laughs> Bill Watson in writing, 
And of course, I will acknowledge our brilliant Dean of Academic Administration, my partner, Jenna Wright. And thank you. And thank you again to the Columbia University Jazz Ensemble, and thank you to all the volunteers. So let's begin. Opening the program will be our chair of theater, Christian Parker, who has the honor of introducing our fabulous guest speaker, Oscar Eustace. Hello, everyone. Uh, I could not be happier to be introducing to you our keynote speaker today. It feels strangely satisfying as I conclude an unnaturally long term as chair to welcome a man who was among the very first to welcome me into the theater profession. In fact, well before I even matriculated into this MFA program, he was a multi-hyphenate role model for me as I nervously entertained the idea of actually forging a career in the theater. I heard about this man who had built, at quite a young age, a sterling national reputation as a director, artistic director, and a dramaturg. Much of this reputation swirled at the time around his having commissioned and shepherded the development of Angels in America, the landmark play that he also directed in its world premiere. As a young man who had a lot of intellectual and creative interests in the theater, but no clear idea of how to shape and contain those professionally, his career and leadership captured my attention and signaled to me that it might be possible to find a path that would feed my whole self and allow me to contribute something substantive to the American theater without being bound to one single title or one single disciplinary path. While I won't go into great detail about the definition of what the hell a dramaturg is, <laughs> let's just say it's a word that more or less encompasses this larger idea. Dramaturgs are keepers of the story and collaborative shapeshifters. They may have diff many different titles, but they lurk everywhere and you should befriend them. Uh, what a surprise and a thrill it was then in the summer of 1998, immediately after I graduated from here with an MFA but little professional experience, to be invited to work on a project in Vermont that was being led by Oscar. A close playwright friend of mine who had been commissioned by Oscar to write a similarly epic two-part play, this one touching primarily on the intersection of race and class, invited me to come to the Breadloaf Conference in, in Middlebury, Vermont, to work with him as a dramaturg on the play. Oscar was already going to be there, guiding the process and serving as the dramaturg, the uber dramaturg, and he most certainly did not need my help. But he did not skip a beat when the playwright asked if he could bring me along, and he said, sure. We'd never met. It was a short little workshop, which at this point, 21 years later, may well be a faded memory for him, but for me, it felt like the official beginning of a career. Oscar folded me into the process seamlessly and with warmth and curiosity. I was invited into every conversation about that play and into the rehearsal room actively and with the kind of respect I would have hardly have expected as a newly minted MFA. This welcome allowed me to listen and learn even more deeply, and being treated as a colleague at that moment in my life well, in some ways, it made all the difference. While his position at the Public Theater New York Shakespeare Festival came after major leadership roles at other not-for-profits, most of you who know about him probably associate him with the public. His 14 years there have been defined by his dynamic devotion to realizing the founding vision of Joe Papp, who wanted the public to truly live up to its name and be a theater for all New Yorkers. He has filled every inch of the former Astor Library in the East Village with a range of work that captures not only the diversity of the city, but a cross-section of genres, styles, and stories that invite debate, identification, and celebration of that which unites us. It's frankly stunning and nearly impossible to track all that happens at the public on his watch. Add to this the programs he created since arriving, Public Works, the Mobile Shakespeare Unit, the Public Forum, and the Emerging Writers Group, and the scale of the civic impact of the public theater comes into vivid focus. Some of you may have heard of a little musical called Hamilton, or Fun Home, or maybe even the plays Eclipsed and Sweat, the latter by our very own professor of playwriting, Lynn Nottage, all of which started at the public and moved to Broadway. But what you might not be quite as aware of are the ways in which Oscar has built a theater that goes to the public it wishes, wishes to reach whether that is in sending professional actors all over the five boroughs in the Mobile Shakespeare Unit, or in engaging community groups and average New Yorkers from some of the city's most culturally, culturally rich but far-flung neighborhoods in the large-scale productions of public works. All of this is to say that this is a man who believes deeply in his stated value of radical inclusion and operates the public with a desire for it to be a true hub of civic dialogue. 
While it seems impossible for any single cultural institution to be all things to all people, Oscar has infused the public with his deep belief in the theater as a key component of, metaphor for, and catalyst for a more democratic society. I'm sure his staff must be exhausted just trying to keep up with him. He is a champion of both artists and audiences, and while his platform and profile have only grown, he has remained unfailingly garrulous and accessible. Funnily enough, we have not actually had the occasion to work together since that brief week in the Green Mountains 21 years ago. Our paths have crossed, however, many times over the years, and in a profession that can often seem rigidly hierarchical, territorial, and competitive, I've always felt engaged and seen by Oscar in exactly the same way as I did when I was the new kid on the block. To me, that speaks to someone who leads with integrity, generosity, and self-knowledge. Even more than his hyphenate, ide hyphenate artistic identity, those things seem like something to aspire to. Please join me in welcoming Oscar Eustace. Thank you, guys. Um, and thank you, Christian, for that really uh, slightly baffling introduction. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little... So, but what that also means is you've already heard enough about me on your graduation day, because uh, the day is about you, uh, this extraordinary thing that you guys have done. And Carol said it's brave, and it's brave, and it's also required an enormous amount of work and dedication and commitment. And you've given all that work and dedication and commitment in order to enter into a life that's going to require more work and dedication and commitment. And that's the thing we have to do, right? Find joy in the work, find joy in what dedication means, find joy in what commitment, not only to our art, but to the thing that's bigger than ourself that our art is for. And I'm just gonna do one thing here. The poet Robert Duncan, the great poet Robert Duncan said a beautiful thing, that my life has been a singing between the chance and the requirement. And I will tell you as an old guy that my peers, the people who've lived as long as I have in this profession, those who are happy are those who figure out that song, who figure out how to dance between what the world wants from them and what they believe in and want to do. They don't hold rigidly to what they want above all else, and they are not a pipe in fortune's finger to sound what stop she please. You don't do whatever the world demands of you. You live in the struggle between those two things. And that is where um, engagement lies, it's where commitment to the world lies, and it's where art lies. And I'm gonna just do a couple of... Um, so, and congratulations to all of you. So I wanna just do a, a story and um, then a few things that arise from that story. And the story is actually about the mobile unit, which is where we take stripped down productions of Shakespeare into prisons and halfway houses and community centers all around the five boroughs. And the first time we did it with the revived mobile unit was about a decade ago. And we took measure for measure. And Nicole Watson, wonderful young actress, played Isabel in Measure for Measure. And we were performing in the what was at that time the women's prison on the west side of Manhattan. And the, I'll just remind you a little bit about the plot of Measure for Measure. I'm sure you all know it intimately. <laughs> but um, Antonio, the new Duke of Venice, has uh, decided that Vienna has decided that all moral sins will be punished to the utmost extent of the law. So he has decided to uh, execute Claudio for impregnating his fiancée. But because they weren't married, he has to die. Isabel, his sister, is a novitiate, studying to be a nun, and she comes to plead for her brother's life. She falls on her knees in front of uh, the Angelo, and she begs for her brother's life. He develops an overwhelming lust for her and announces that he will spare Claudio's life if she will give up her virgin patent to him. And if she doesn't do it, her brother will die tomorrow. And he sweeps off stage, leaving her alone. And at the women's prison, Nicole turned out to the audience and said the first line that Shakespeare has assigned her, to whom should I complain? And a woman in the audience immediately shouted, the police! <laughs> and Nicole looked a little startled, but then simply said the next line that Shakespeare had written for her. If I did report this, who would believe me? And the woman said, no one, girl. 
And in that moment, a couple of things were happening. First of all, we were experiencing something that we experienced in the mobile unit, that the need for stories, the need to participate in narrative and see oneself inside the narratives of our culture is as passionate and powerful as our desires for food and for sex. We need to see ourselves as part of the culture story. And you can feel, it's why when I send my staff to the prisons, they come back saying, why do we do anything else? because the importance of what we make is so clear. Second thing is in a really geeky way, we found out something about how those soliloquies were written. And you suddenly go, well, of course. Did we think those groundlings, those illiterate groundlings were standing for three hours and saying, shh, shh, I can't hear to each other. <laughs> it was call and response. They were talking back to each other. And so that's hugely exciting. And then thirdly, there's a clue there, a trail, to why Shakespeare is the greatest writer in the history of the English language, maybe in the history of the world. Because he was having to write for everybody. Sometimes you will hear, I, I'm sure not at a fine school like Columbia, that Shakespeare you know, writes some parts of the plays are for the Oxford grads, some parts of the plays are for the aristocrats, and then there's the comedy that's for the groundlings. And anyone who's been in a theater know that can't possibly work. You, you don't like a play if you have to check out for five minutes while the author is talking to somebody else in the audience. That's called a failure. You don't do it. A play is a time-based art. It has to take everybody through a story at the same time. They can experience it in different ways or at different levels, but we have to take everybody in. So what does that mean? That means that Shakespeare, who we know was a pretty good poet because we have the sonnet, so he's got talent. But what made him the greatest writer in the history of the English language was his audience. Because for the first time in Western history since the classic Athenian age, Shakespeare was speaking to an audience that was as diverse and democratic as his country. And a lot of things created that. One of them was the Tudor Compromise in order to stop the civil war between Catholics and Protestants. Writers not only didn't have to write about religion, they were not allowed to write about religion. So suddenly, Shakespeare was faced with having to write to this diverse audience that represented everybody, and he was free to write about whatever he wanted, except with one exception, he had to entertain everybody. So what he was doing by having to do that was not simply reflecting back to the audience things they would be interested in. By the very nature of the field, he's reflecting back the things they have in common. He's actually taking them through that journey together, and by taking them through that journey, teaching everybody by the form that they had more in common with each other than they thought. He was holding the mirror up to them and saying, all of you people from different strands of life, you're all one people. And that's what the theater does at its best. It creates community. It doesn't just talk about community. It actually makes it happen. That's why it's the most democratic medium we have. And that process of making the audience into one body is a process that has happened in every great expansion of the theatrical art. Every, certainly in the United States, from the federal theater to the regional theater movement, every time the art expands, it's because the audience is expanding. We're expanding who we speak to, which means also you have to expand who gets to speak. And now I'm gonna tell a story that's out of my field um, because it was important to me. And it's directed to all of you artists. I went to, about 20 years ago, there was an exhibition at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, LACMA, of the Mexican muralists, Frida Kahlo, Sigueras, Rivera, and I loved their work and I went to see it, but I hadn't read very closely. And it was their work from the 1920s, their early work. And I was stunned to be facing room after room full of bowls of fruit, still lives, that had no country of origin implied by them, that looked for all the world like I'd wandered into a European Impressionist workshop in the 1920s. And I was bewildered for a while, but then what I realized, and what got me incredibly exciting, excited, was the Mexican muralists didn't somehow be overcome by an emotional impulse, the desire to paint on buildings, and somehow that just happened. No, what they did was they sat down 
and they talked about how what they believed about the world could be united with their art. And what did they need to change about their art to talk about the things they wanted to talk about and to reach the people they wanted to reach. And so that movement was thought up. And we undervalue that sometimes as ours. We undervalue the way that we need to think through how to make our lives make sense. We have to think through how to integrate the different parts of ourselves so that our work is actually reflecting all of who we are, including what we believe about the world, including who we're trying to include in the story of America or the story of our race, of our species. And that thought process is something that's not just possible, it's required to make important art, which always means that if you're thinking that way, you have to think outside the box because we're artists, right? By definition, everything we make is unique. You can't take a form that worked before and shove your content in it and say that's a work of art because the work of art has a signature, has an address, has a timestamp, and it has an author, you, whether it's a single you or a collective you. And so we get to think about this, we get to think about what we want our art to try to do, and we get to not just make our art, we get to change the boundaries around what art is in order to try to reach people. Christian talked about the Public Works Program. One of the key things about the Public Works, which I won't describe in detail, but is that we put amateurs and professionals side by side. And there's a key idea behind that. The idea that making art is not the property of a few, and everybody else is condemned to watch it or consume it. But making art is a fundamental part of being a human being. And some people are lucky enough and dedicated enough to get to practice it 10,000 hours and more. And some people get to do it a few times in their life. But it's a continuum. And everybody is on it. And, we can, and bringing these amateurs into our performances at the Delacorte have made them not just social justice experiments, but they've made the greatest works of theater that I've seen in the last decade. The art has been significant. So, uh, here's the problem. There's so much I want to say to you. There's so much I want to talk about. But I'm going to wrap up here in just a couple of minutes. And I want to say that one of the things that our economic system tends to do is to turn everything into a commodity everything into an object that can be purchased. And what the role of art is, in a way, is to take those commodities and to dissolve them, to turn them back into what they really are, which is the expression of a set of relationships among human beings. The commodity form hides what is actually going on. What is really going on always is relationships between us. And as artists, our job is to try to open that up. Whether that's David Wong creating this brilliant idea of turning Rodgers and Hammerstein's King and I on its head and writing a play about a Chinese film executive who comes to the United States to teach Hillary Clinton how to rule and, by the way, how to love. <laughs> Whether it's Lynn Nottage, who brilliantly set out to write what became the Pulitzer Prize-winning Sweat, by simply starting to research the poorest county in the United States, where Reading, Pennsylvania was, and going there and visiting and getting to know everybody there, and finally writing a play that was not an expression of her. It was an expression of her immersed in the lives of other people whose voices weren't heard. And that created an absolutely extraordinary work of art. Whether it's Lin-Manuel Miranda, who's saying, right, let's tell the story of the founding of the country but let's tell it through the eyes of the only bastard immigrant orphan who was a founding father. And by doing that, understanding first on a visceral level, but then very clearly on an intellectual level, he's reclaiming the founding of America for all of those immigrants, voluntary and involuntary, who actually make up this country and say, actually, it's our country too, and we get to tell its story. And I'm going to close with a story, actually, that starts with Hamilton and turns into sweat, because it's the best story I know how to tell you. Some of you will remember that um, shortly before uh, Donald Trump and Mike Pence's inauguration in January of 2017, the vice president-elect came to see Hamilton. 
Uh, and we composed what, you know, we had 15 minutes notice. We found out at 2 o'clock that afternoon he was coming. So we composed what we thought was an extremely polite um, and very carefully worded speech about the concerns that members of the cast had about the incoming administration. And we read it from the stage. Brandon Victor Dixon read it from the stage. And I have to say, Pence was great. He stopped stock still in the lobby to listen to the entire speech before he left. Uh, when he came in and was, was booed, it was a house full of New Yorkers, um, he actually turned to his son and he said, that's what democracy sounds like. Um, so he behaved admirably. Not so much his boss, um, who fired off. I'm, I'm delighted to say that this would be the first of two times that the president demanded I apologize to him. Um, <laughs> it's gotten lost in the mail somehow. But um, in response to, in response to the, the president-elect's reaction, an online boycott of Hamilton began and had collected 200,000 signatures very, very quickly. And I looked at this and I went, something is wrong with this picture. None of these people were ever going to see Hamilton. <laughs> it was not coming to a city near them. If it did, they couldn't afford a ticket. Or if they could afford a ticket, they didn't have the connections to get it. They weren't boycotting us. We'd boycotted them way before they turned against us. And then at that moment, I looked at a red and blue electoral map in the United States. And if you look at a red and blue electoral map, broken down by county, not by state, so it's the, real, the detailed. And if you were to say to an unsuspecting theater artistic director, this is a map of where the nonprofit theaters in the United States are. All the blue are where the nonprofit theaters are, and the red are where there are no nonprofit theaters. It would map uncannily closely. And there's a lot of reasons that I can talk about how my profession has abdicated its responsibilities. But the thing that is just true is that for the last 40 years, essentially we have been saying to the red parts of this country the same thing that the economy has been saying that the educational system has been saying, and that the culture has been saying. You don't matter. We have nothing for you. We're not interested in what you have to say. Good luck. Turn out the light on your way out. And that abandonment of half the population of this country has, of course, led to what some of us might consider a terrible revenge. But again, what we have to look at is what we're responsible for about that. Inclusion is not simply about including the fantastic diversity of our urban centers. It's about also saying that everybody in this country has a right to what we're creating. Everybody in this country has a right to see what we're creating, to participate in what we're creating, and to be listened to. So we sent out last fall a tour of Sweat, Lynn Nottage's brilliant, brilliant play, mm -hmm. to rural counties in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota and learned more than I can say. The need, the desire, the appetite for the work was extraordinary. And the conversations afterwards were deeper and richer than any that I've participated in. Nobody talked about Republican and Democrat. Nobody talked about Trump. Nobody talked about electoral politics. They talked about what it felt like to lose their job. They talked about the tensions in the community when some people lost their jobs and some people didn't. They talked about what it felt like to watch the main street of the town that they were born in get boarded up because businesses couldn't make a living there. And it's just a taste, and I don't know how we're gonna be able to keep this going, but I know it's some of the most important work in my life and that we've got to keep going and try to bridge these divides because otherwise the future for all of us doesn't look very good. Plato famously said, <laughs> transitions, who needs them? It's the 21st century that what we saw wasn't reality, that we were bound together inside of a cave with our heads facing inward and we were looking at the wall of the cave and what we thought was reality was actually just the shadows being cast by reality which passed between us in a great fire and that fire cast those shadows and we thought that was real. Well, what he was saying in essence is that we're looking at movies and we think they're real life. We're creating art that isn't telling us what's out there. We're creating art that's reinforcing our false ideas about what is real. 
And I'm not saying that artists have the ability to break all our chains and lead the people out into the sunlight of real life, but I do know that those of us who are professional storytellers have no right to claim that we just didn't understand, that we thought all those images were real, that we didn't know we were living in the cave. Thank you. Wow, so wonderful. He squeezed us in between 50 other things, so <laughs> had to go, but I think that was a perfect thing to hear today for all of you. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's quite moving to me. Um, now we have your moment, the recognition of the graduates. The chairs of the programs will each speak, quite eloquently usually, and then, with the assistance of the directors of academic administration, they will present the degrees to our, all of you. And this is the order. Hilary Brocker for the film MFA and MA in Film and New Media, assisted by Hannah Seifu, who is standing in for Sarah Mason, who, um, as you know, had an accident and can't walk right now. Uh, Christian Parker for theater, assisted by Lauren Elmore. Matthew Buckingham for visual art and sound art. Assisted by Carrie Gundersdorf. And Sam Lipside for writing, assisted by Clarence Koo, who is standing in, standing in for Bill Wadsworth today. So we're gonna begin with Hilary Brocker, Chair of Film. Thank you, thank you. Um, as a filmmaker, I'd hope to give you something to look at up there. Um, <laughs> instead, I bring you the lonely, awkward silence that comes before you make a film or anything else, when it's just you and, if you're lucky, a, a piece of paper. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> no, um, I, I would also like to tell you a story to uh, specifically to solve the bruises of the last bunch of years. I hope you got most of those bruises having fun. I know there were some hard falls, and I know there were some that felt more cruelly intentioned. But the fact is, I'm standing in front of hundreds of the next generation of storytellers and artists, and I have no story to measure up to that. Maybe you don't either, not today. Maybe you're tired from all these years of cracking open your consciousness to try and find something beautiful and real to share with us. Maybe you're worrying no one will take the time to look at it. Maybe you're uneasy from confronting the idea of uh, all those hours you worked and how instead of a paycheck it earned you debt and is that how it's going to be with art? <laughs> a lot of the time, yes. Um, Maybe you're wondering what you're going to do next. I'm saying these things to you because they're true. And when you don't know where you're going next, it's great to start from what you know to be true. It's the difference between art and artifice, from the thing that sets you free, from the thing that distracts you and holds you back. Don't get me wrong, we need both art and artifice. Just keep a sharp eye on them. All right, I'm turning the page. All right, I don't know where you're going either, um, but the good news is that <laughs> Google Maps can't yet track the passage of future time, so wherever it is, it's still yours. You will take with you from here your vision, your craft, your confidence, your conviction. Please take some anger too. Uh, there's plenty to be angry about and, and it will come in handy, trust me. Um, 
Take your love. I hope all of you found love here, friends, collaborators, soulmates, and maybe a few annoying people who taught you something you couldn't learn any other damn way. <laughs> I hope you found that you love your work and that you love yourself. As you pack your little carry-on, please know that you don't actually have to worry about fitting any of that in there because it's part of you. Like the sweet, pungent smell of onions cooking on your family's stove. When I say it, you remember it, right? Same thing, browning onions. Incidentally, that smell cuts through any grief or despair. So now you have that too. Okay. Um, so now rather than thinking about what you're going to pack, you can think about what you can let go of. I think in recent years, all of us, out of a very well-intentioned desire to simulate a connection to nature and to other human beings, have become hoarders of both material objects and information. Um, and I think we're all just sort of waking up to realize you can't fit all that and still have room for a connection to nature or other human beings. And you're going to have to stay laid in your feet and ready to run towards the things you love and away from the bullies until the moment's right. Bring comfortable shoes because you're going to have to stand up for a lot of things for clean air and water, for the right to make your own choices with your very own body, and who you will be, and how you will love, and who you will love. And you're going to have to stand up for the person next to you and the person next to them, and they will have to stand up for you. And you're going to have to do this for days and weeks and years and lifetimes. That's all my generation can really tell you, is apparently you just have to keep standing up. Um, you're already doing this. I see it every day and I'm so proud. Okay, I'm gonna follow all of you on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> so it's not really goodbye. We'll, we'll share our joys. We're going to grieve as hate burns down our villages from the inside out. We're going to offer each other both rage, love, and, and comfort, typing with our thumbs on the crowded subway, traveling paycheck to paycheck as big data quietly harvests our disquiet and turns it into a compulsion to buy new bed sheets. So I will follow you on Facebook until I don't. And when that happens, know that it doesn't mean I don't care. It means I do. All right, so what I'm saying is it's okay to forget your phone charger sometimes. It, it's good to get lost and get frustrated and bored. That's how Alice finds the rabbit hole every single time. All right. What I want to do next is take off my glasses <laughs> and to let you go. Travel lightly. Make sure each day your fingers or your toes touches the real live earth that is your only birthright. Eat well with good people. Be a fool for love, not money, and come back and tell me that story. I, I am so not done. I, I was really excited about the theme of goodbye. Okay. Um, so this is why I should not take off my glasses. Okay. I would now like to, and I, I want to note that Sarah Mason, uh, I talked to her this morning, she sends her love, she is so proud of you, she is so excited for you. I would like to introduce the film program's manager of academic administration, Hannah Seifu, who will read... <laughs> Um, and Hannah will read the names of the 2019 MFA graduates in film and the MA graduates in film and media studies. <laughs> yeah, you gotta go into the center. Oh, you go to the center. I go to the center.
Turn around. <laughs> Sarah Ismail Abdullah. <laughs> oh, Gaudi Aldakar. <laughs> Leticia Akel Escarate. <laughs> Natalie Andrea Alvarez Messon. <laughs> Angie Bao. John, uh, Robert John Bellin. <laughs> Yusira Boshita. <laughs> Mary Margaret Briggs. <laughs> Leonardo Campanier. <laughs> Minje Chang. <laughs> Ava Craig. Christina Ramona Crisostomo. <laughs> Estefania de la Chica Serrano. <laughs> Sierra Brianne Thompson Dahl. Austin Joseph Drakes. Arieri Isiri. Ban Faki. Arlene Fernandez. Patrick John Ford. Afsana Gavorgan. Jessica May Gibson. Minami Goto. Benjamin Joseph Gottlieb. Frank Joseph Graziano. Carly Amanda Ivory. Mahek Jawani. Gerald Bam Johnson. <laughs> Jennifer Marie Kaiser. <laughs> oh, I'm running out of room. Susie Jean Kim. <laughs> Maya Korn. <laughs> Ratusha Kool Kari. Carney. E. Lua. Thomas Scott Locke. Lauren Marie Lopez de Victoria. Ewing Luo. Akiko Matsumoto. Taylor Mendonca. Sandra Mitrovich. Jacqueline Noel. Lindsay Caroline Peterson. Rhea Prasad. Christy Marie Richmond. Samuel Rimlin. Noelia Rodriguez Dessa. Nicholas Payne Santos. James Connor Simpson. 
Nicholas Rocco Singer. Jocelyn Jade Smith. David Marr Stephenson. Aya, oh, I'm sorry. Aya Stolentenberg. Grace Sui. Shishi Wang. Mong Chong. Young Ji. Camila Zavalaha. Now we'll read the graduates of the Film and Media Studies MA degree. Sonia Bessie Brand Fisher. Miranda Ariana Diapolito. Benjamin Gaff. Xinjiang Sung. Shui Suyang. Yi Xing Zong. Ting Hao Zhou. Rei Zhu. Thank you. Class of 2019. Well, here we are, at long last. Somehow this moment always seems to creep up on me. It feels, in a way, like you all just got here. I'm guessing you may feel the opposite way and cannot believe how exhausted you are uh, or how eager you are to be finished. I hope you'll also feel like you've been stretched, challenged, and prodded to become more fully expressed versions of the talented and engaged individuals you all were when you got here in the now infamous fall of 2016. In a way, I'm graduating with you today. This is one of my last official duties after seven years as chair of the theater program before I go on leave, and I'll come back as a professor for other people, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm finishing up my term as chair. Uh, apart from the stress of having to write a speech worthy of this event, I promise this is one of the very best official duties any chair can sign up for. The chair is a rotating position that normally lasts three years, maybe five if you're doing okay, not wanting to rend your garments and run screaming into the night, uh, and there isn't someone either jumping to be next in line or ready to be strong-armed to take over. I ended up serving in the chair for seven years, not because I am in any way autocratic or Lannister or Targaryen-like by nature, <laughs> but mainly because our program has been in a state of accelerated evolution and change, and the faculty and the deans asked me to. Now, now it is really time to pass the torch. There are always more things one could have done, but we've done a lot in the past years as a faculty, and I think our program is as strong, admired, and dynamic as it's ever been, and I think that stands you in good stead. It is, uh, it is natural in moments like this to think about what you have learned uh, and how you have changed or been changed by your time here. I certainly have been doing some serious reflection on my time leading this program, and I thought I'd share just a few of the things I think I've learned. In a few cases, maybe I already knew these things, I just didn't necessarily know I knew them. It turns out that leading a multi-pronged, complex theater program is not so different than leading a theater or production. So no matter your discipline, I hope you'll find a little bit of insight in this. Actually, I hope that those of you in film, writing, and visual arts will too. If we as artists want to lead the cultural conversation and model values in our practice that can be duplicated elsewhere in society, maybe there's something here for you too. Number one. 
Building consensus is hard, but worth it. It is totally possible to walk into any leadership position and rule by executive order. With access to a budget, status, and power, you can embody a vision by unilaterally making decisions and using the talents and skills of your staff and colleagues to implement your will. I would argue, however, that this will yield only temporary results and do nothing to earn you the goodwill or collaborative commitment of your colleagues. What if you treated leadership, a leadership role like a writer's room? What if you approached your efforts to build a team around the central questions of what is the story we want to tell and how do we want to tell it? This does not mean you step back and subsume your own ideas, but rather it leaves you an opportunity to come up with a better plan and a better story because others feel empowered to pitch their ideas into the cauldron in hopes that the new stew will be better for it. One thing that we as a faculty discuss often is who do we say we are and how does the curriculum we offer actually reflect that or not? The challenge to you in building consensus is not how to get everyone to agree with you, to any of us, uh, but rather how to get everyone to agree to a bigger version, a vision than any one of you as individuals could have come up with on your own. Therein lies the value of collaboration, and that approach will more likely lead you to making a theatrical event or a play that is greater than the sum of its parts and truly feels expansive to its audience. Two, you can't please everyone all the time. This may sound like a slight contradiction to the above, but I don't really think it is. I have really come to believe that if I'm doing my job boldly and with a clarity of vision, and that could be as chair or as a director or as a dramaturg or producer, whatever, whatever your role is, some people are probably not going to align precisely with that vision and not be very happy when they perceive that decisions have not been made in their favor. Certainly this comes into play when you are hiring and firing people, but it is also just part of the deal when you are setting high standards for a group, listing clear priorities, dividing up resources, or making choices in a rehearsal room. Let's face it, we all want to be liked, and our work can foster a real sense of community and camaraderie, but not every necessary decision for the betterment of a given project is going to be painless or popular. The key in riding through the tough moments of negative feedback from friends and colleagues is to go into the decision-making process with a desire for consensus building, a sense of what you hope to achieve with the decision you're making, and how it might benefit the greatest number of others. We all have to suffer criticism that we don't want, whether that is in the form of a rejection for a job, a negative student evaluation, or the ire of a collaborator who didn't get their way. But if we know we led with a sense of personal integrity, listened carefully, and made decisions based on solving a problem rather than self-aggrandizement or personal peak, we can weather the storm and retain the respect of our peers even when they're a little pissed off. The coda to this is, of course, admitting when you were wrong in the first place or made a bum decision, but more on that later. Three, you don't always get a medal for service. While art making or even teaching and administering a department can get you the affirmation and accolades of audiences or your peers, we can't count on it. Oftentimes, the most important leadership is never really acknowledged or, ever, or even seen by those who benefit the most from it. This brings to mind the image often evoked by my colleague Anne Bogart when she refers to the invisible hand of the director. How can we train and retrain ourselves to take pleasure and feel gratification in seeing a story well told and moving or stirring audiences without needing them to know that we had a hand in it? Even for an actor, much of the work they do in, rehearsal pro in the rehearsal process is hidden from view. The audience never sees it, but it was there. After a performance of a play I recently directed, an, an enthusiastic audience member approached me in the lobby and asked if I was the director. I said yes, and he said he really enjoyed the show, but it seemed so well written and acted that he wondered what I actually did. <laughs> For a split second, I thought to myself, seriously, couldn't you tell from watching it? And then I thought, no, Christian, this guy doesn't know it, but this is actually a compliment. So I answered him as simply as I could. I suppose I made sure the story was told. Four, patience is a virtue. Move upon in chess, and you have a whole different game. When I stepped into the role of, ch as, of chair, I saw a veritable laundry list of things I hoped to see change or grow in the theater program. Daunted by this, and also at that time I was not anticipating having seven years to work on it, uh, I remember talking with Dean Becker. She very wisely said to me that you never can anticipate how seemingly small moves will reverberate or for how long. This was a great insight that allowed me to see that it's a long game. Make change where you can. Solve the problems that are right in front of you. Don't try to take five pages worth of notes all at once. Don't feel pressure to rewrite the whole second act overnight unless someone's forcing you to. Don't throw out the whole set design when you could eliminate one wall and fix it. 
We all feel impatient about the pace of change, especially right now. I'm not saying to intentionally go slow. In the theater, we never have enough time, right? Having patience is not about letting go of a sense of urgency. Rather, it's about knowing what is achievable in the present moment and what is not, and what decisions that you can make now that will have the best chance of solving and not worsening a problem. Fast change is not the same thing as deep or effective change. Five, this one is short and not always easy. Assume the best intentions in others. In my experience, it is extremely rare that anyone operates from a place of actively wishing you ill or wants to get in your way. It's happened, but it's, it's rare. If you can walk into any collaboration or leadership role assuming that you have the essential goodwill of others and genuinely also have it towards them, you will help to engender it even if it wasn't actually there to begin with. It is extremely easy to find enemies where they didn't previously exist. And it is much more satisfying to discover new friends and allies. And certainly in the theater, it is one of the primary and most enduring forms of compensation that we get. Six, always ask, who am I serving in my work? If the answer is myself, an audience of me, is that enough for you? There's no judgments there, but if it is, theater may not be the best storytelling form for you. <laughs> we live in a time where individual identity can often be used as a shield or a fortress from behind which we more and more seldom emerge to show our fullest selves. How can we bring ourselves into the act of public storytelling in such a way that we can spur empathy and shared identification in an audience? How do we stretch and reach to tell made-up stories that aren't about us? How, in this moment, can we write and perform and imagine stories that are both radically inclusive and deeply specific? Who do we want to engage, and, and are we actually willing to talk to our own audience, as, as, as Oscar was saying? Why bother doing what we do? Certainly in chairing a department, not always a position filled with glory, as I mentioned, I've had to ask myself the question over and over, what are we really doing this for? How can we make an MFA program that positions all of our students for success? How can Columbia's graduate program be a leader in impacting not only the next generation of theater artists, but how can our graduates, by extension, be positioned to grow audiences and make our art form more culturally relevant to a wider range of people? I challenge you to give yourself and your work a higher purpose, as it were. It'll make it so much easier to keep going when the going gets tough, I promise. Finally, and this is the big one, and maybe the hardest, lead with vulnerability. What does this mean? It can mean a lot of things, and it's gonna mean different things to each of you. For me, this is a process that did not come naturally or easily. Let go of needing an immediate result. Show your colleagues where you're uncertain. Acknowledge both what you're good at and where you struggle. Ask for help. Take credit where it's due. Give genuine compliments, and take them when offered, genuinely. Let other people do their work. Make mistakes, own them. Make great work, own that. Let people know what, know what makes you tick and what you love. Invite your colleagues to tell you if you say something that pisses them off or offends them. Know that this is likely. Try to make it less likely by expressing genuine curiosity in others. Don't pretend to be an expert when you're not. Don't lecture people who aren't experts when you are. See the happy results of your work as part of a tapestry of all of the work that a lot of people contributed in order to make it so. Even the intern, even the business manager. Embrace the discomfort of being challenged. Don't retreat from a, from a disagreement or conflict. Solve it. Value the people you are lucky enough to surround yourself with. At the end of the day, that's what we get. Deep relationships built around the pursuit of truth, and if we're lucky, unknowable relationships with all the people sitting out there in the dark, ready to see and hear. Look around you for a second, theater graduates. No, really, look around. These are some of the people you will take with you in your creative and personal lives. Hang on to them. You have a common language now. You are all poised to lead in so many different ways and disciplines. We are living in a time in which civil discourse, even sometimes within the hallowed halls of this Ivy League university, has become profoundly eroded and debased. You are stepping out, the, out of here into a society more riven by division than at any time that I can remember. But as theater makers, you are uniquely positioned to help our country heal by sparking engaged, nuance, and complex discussion between people. Theater requires that we listen to one another on stage and across the footlights. It does, not uh, it does not require that we agree. It does not require that we even completely understand one another. It invites curiosity, generosity of spirit, and optimism. You have all of these things in great supply. I know it's true, and I cannot wait to see what you make with them. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you.
I want to introduce uh, Lauren Britt Elmore, the Director of Academic Administration, who will read your names. Daniel Craig Adams. <laughs> Mark Herbert Barford. Morgan Lee Beach. Candace Gifty Buahaney. Yoni Schiller Bronstein. Ellen Elizabeth Bryan. Jack. Jack Tui Kalk. Yung Ting Chang. Don Elizabeth Clements. Caitlin and Elise Dominguez. Cody James Elliott. Jessica Elizabeth Imanis. Paloma Estavez. Elizabeth Eleanor Frankel. Patricia Ann Garvey. Miriam Mikkel Grill. <laughs> May Lee Heeman. <laughs> You're silly. Mwah. Gethsemane, Amy Heron Coward. <laughs> Andreas Yunchi Huan. Yes. Anthony Peter Jadis. Anna Elizabeth Jastrzemski. Yeah. Brittany Rose Kuhn. Ejen <laughs> Leo. Claire Gerlach Mahoney. Michaela Devra Mahoney. Zachary Noah Marlin. Laura Mercedes, excuse me, Laura Mercedes Martinez. Robert Christopher Maxwell. Emma Helen Marie McFarland. James Richard Monahan. <laughs> Alexis L. Nalbandian. <laughs> Jacqueline Chinoso Wabueze. <laughs> Joseph David Odom. Javier David Padilla. <laughs> Je Jeffrey Lamont Page. Here you go, baby. Andres Santiago Pina. You're welcome. Catherine Elizabeth Wertheimer Pincus. Bethany Leanne Sharp. Allison Ray Simone. 
James Smart. Manuela Sosa Santaella Ea. Mariana Starostelsky. Starostelsky, excuse me. Oh, Jesus, here we go. Halfrither Thora Trigvadotter. Oh, sorry, sorry, Roberto, you're next. I didn't see that. Roberto Tolentino. Tamara Abisoye Tomatkili. <laughs> Jennifer, Jennifer Ashton Waxman. Megan Ashley Webb. Catherine Whitney Wilkinson. Here we go. Roshin Shu. Please join me in congratulating the 2019 graduates of Columbia University School of the Arts Theater Program. Thank you. Congratulations, 2019. So I also want to share something about myself. Something that we have in common. Something you already know about yourself. I am a time traveler. Like you, I have arrived here from the past, and I often visit the future. In my case, I came from the year 1963. <laughs> I left the day the Warren Commission started investigating President Kennedy's assassination. The same day, rumors began circulating that Malcolm X would be replaced at the as the minister of mosque number seven here in New York City. This was also the day the US Congress scheduled the first hearing on the Civil Rights Act that would be passed the following year. Joan Sutherland had returned to the Metropolitan Opera and Jean Genet's Jean The Maids was playing off Broadway. Perhaps one of you is a fellow traveler from that moment or nearby. People are time travelers. This is recognizable in each of us in many ways, not least by the anachronisms that we carry with us. Certain words or turns of phrase from another time or the way we dress ourselves. Please close your eyes if you wish. You don't have to. Either way, you can think about this. The other day, one of my colleagues reminded me that for persons who have normal vision, closing the eyes frees up large parts of the brain to do other things. In the early 1990s, neuroscientists doing research on brain activity noticed something odd. Their test subjects' brains were consuming more energy when they were in a resting state than when they were actively engaged in the lab experiments. Four more years of study determined that in our resting states, we do not rest. Left on its own, the human brain lapses into one of its most characteristic maneuvers. It time travels. 
Imagine you are flying on an airplane from New Orleans to Dallas, a trip of about 90 minutes. You have taken this flight many times. You are reading the new biography of Angela Carter. About half an hour into the flight, after finishing a chapter, you put the book down on the empty seat next to you and you close your eyes. You think about arriving in Dallas and hope your sister won't be late picking you up. She sometimes is. Why is that? You remember once asking her, and she became defensive. <laughs> you make a mental note not to mention it to her again. You yourself are often late for appointments. Does it have something to do with the way you and your siblings were raised? An image of your family kitchen, as it looked when you were five years old, pops into your head. The image, in the image, you're sitting with your sister and your father. You're looking out the window. Then you think of Angela Carter, at the same age, in 1945, having been evacuated to Yorkshire during the Blitz, sitting with her aunt in her aunt's kitchen. You wonder if there's a connection between that kitchen in the north of England and Angela Carter's short story titled The Kitchen Child, which you have not read. Then you recall discovering Carter's writing only last year at that bookshop on Ninth Avenue. In this state of mind, our thoughts deliberately and involuntarily shuttle back and forth between what might happen in an hour something that happened two years ago, then 20 years ago, or 70, then last year. This is why we close our eyes when we are having trouble recalling a forgotten name, or we want to imagine something we've never seen before, but we hope to. To our own cherished and dreaded memories, we add the memories of other people. We absorb the memories of family members a generation or two before us, if we happen to know them and hear their stories. We even do this with the stories of people we have never known, if they are vivid enough. These memories give us access to a visitable past that reaches far back before our own experience. And soon enough, we also recognize that we are now living in what was once to them their future. But all this toing and froing bypasses the present moment. The author Eric Russell writes that our bodies always move in the present, and our bodies are themselves the dividing line between the past and the future. Our minds are more free. Another author, Ursula K. Le Guin, in one of her novels, writes that story is our only boat for sailing on the river of time. This, of course, leaves it open that we might use our nautical skills to tack back and forth, upstream and downstream, forward and backward, as well as let the current sweep us along. This is why, contrary to appearances today, this is not commencement day, for me anyway. Think back, it is late in the day or early in the evening, the last moments of light, the edges of things are disappearing and colors are flattening. You decide to let go of the day. It has been a tiring one. Temperatures were in the mid 70s and it was dry, or maybe it was cooler, but overcast and uncomfortably humid. Your thoughts turn to the future. You've just set out on an uncertain journey. School begins on the other side of the approaching weekend. That day at the end of the summer, before your first semester here, is the day that for me is commencement day. the day we began working together. Today is not an end or a start. Today, like every day, 
we find ourselves in the middle of things. Happily, we have no choice. Last school year was a challenging school year for all of us in, visual arts, in the visual arts program. We experienced locally and painfully issues people are facing nationally and globally. We rediscovered firsthand how fragile institutions can be. And we, remind, we were reminded that institutions are people upon whose decisions so much depends. You strengthened your bonds with each other and with us, persevered and prevailed. Above all, you excelled in your studios, producing the most ambitious thesis work I've yet seen. I admire you for all of this, and I have learned so much from you. James Baldwin believed the world is held together by the love and the passion of a very few people. Please continue to be one of those people who holds the world together. By the time of what we now call the fifth century BC, in the land that was known as Hellas, before the Romans renamed it Greece, a new genre of writing emerged among the ruling classes there. This genre was named logograph logography. It combined geographical records with cultural information and was meant to serve as source material for map making maps, political arguments, military strategy, and legal claims. The genre was therefore concerned with separating fact from myth in a way that poetry and mythology was not. This led to a practice of dividing narratives by their nearness to or distance from truth and probability. Narrative literature fell into three categories. The true, like the true, and myth. Hecateus of Miletus was the best known of these early log ah, sorry, logographers. His writing has been placed as a precursor to the history writing of Herodotus and, and Thucydides. Two important works by Hecateus are known. His journey around the earth, an account of the lands and cultures on the shores of the Mediterranean, and his genealogies, which attempt to rationalize the many and paradoxical tellings and retellings of the stories of the Greek heroes. Hecateus's work survives only in fragments. One fragment can be found that indicates the direction of his thought and is a predictor of the shape and goals for the idea of history that we now live and wrestle with. This fragment is most likely from the preface of his genealogies and is relevant to us today. Hecateus said, I write what follows as it seems to me to be, to be true. For the stories of the Greeks, as they appear to me, are numerous and ridiculous. Thank you. And now, and now I would like to introduce the Director of Academic Administration for Visual Arts and Sound Art, Carrie Gundersdorf, who will read the names of our MFA graduates.
Shireen Abrashamian. <laughs> Priscilla Aleman. <laughs> Nicole Kathleen Burka. Uh, Vivian Chu. <laughs> Nurse. Vikram Devecha. Rafael Dominech. Travis Faircloff. Annette and Toby Herr. Noah Jackson. Esteban Jefferson. Tejun Kim. <laughs> Susanna Louise Kim Coter. Zaskia Kraft. I'm just slowing it. Rachel Labine. Kate Crouch right now. Kate Lehman. Ruhi Macnogia. Sorry. Jessica Mahones Martinez. James McCracken. Jeffrey Maris. Dante uh, Migone Ojeda. Coco Young. <laughs> Batami Rivlin. <laughs> Emma Schwartz. <laughs> Pauline Shaw. <laughs> Jacqueline Silverbush. Hinda Rivka Weiss. Kian, aka Kiki Williams. Ayung Yu. Kamar, oh, and for sound arts, Kamari Carter. Thank you, congratulations. All right, let's wrap this up, right? <laughs> On behalf of the writing program, I'd like to congratulate all of the School of the Arts graduates assembled here and wish you all wonderful years ahead. I'd also like to congratulate all the parents and friends, for I know the people in gowns here would not have achieved so much without your support. That's right, yeah. You can't say that enough. Uh, and as for the writing program graduates, it's been quite a trip, hasn't it? And what you've accomplished is no small thing. You've completed one of the most rigorous MFA programs in the country, working with some of the most celebrated writers in the language. You've watched your prose and poetry get better 
and worse <laughs> and better and worse and better again. Let's keep it there. Uh, as Thomas Mann famously said, a writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than it is for other people. <laughs> and even that's a pretty clunky sentence, <laughs> which only reinforces his point. Well, I'm just kidding mostly, but if we've done our work correctly, Mann's sentiment makes complete sense to you. You are eager for that difficulty. You're hungry for it. And now is a major moment. Today you will receive your diploma. I think it might be a fake diploma. You get the real one in the mail, but... <laughs> you'll get your diploma and you'll get your license to write. <laughs> so now begins the great confusing journey. What to do? Well, you can keep writing. You don't need much to do that. You don't need studio space. You don't need expensive equipment. What an advantage. You need a pen and some paper, or maybe a laptop, or heaven forbid, but I know it's true, your phone. But turn off the internet, trust me on that. So you will write. And yes, it's tough to adjust to the new conditions. No workshops unless you start your own. No deadlines except for the ultimate one. And you... Well, it's true, it's true. And you probably exhausted from the so-called real world because no doubt you'll need employment and that's no joke. It's hard out there. And it's always been hard for those starting out. And sometimes it finishes hard too. Often in this neighborhood, I see people walking around with those t-shirts with famous book covers on them. Moby Dick, Great Gat The Great Gatsby. And I wonder if these people know that Moby Dick destroyed Melville's career that Gatsby nearly did the same to Fitzgerald, of course. In the latter case, I think the alcohol had something to do with it, too. <laughs> but still, the lesson here is you can't control your reception. All you can really control is your work, your practice as an artist. You can write. You can just keep writing. And, you know, I say be joyous in the knowledge that some lawyers are having a hard time, too. But it's definitely tough out there for serious writers. You've read all the articles. It's not that artists should suffer. That's an old canard. But the world often makes it so. The world doesn't care until it cares. You can't just wish it otherwise. But there is another related challenge facing you that I think you can overcome all by yourself. The other problem facing you is expectation the pressure you put on yourself, and the pressure you feel from friends and family to prove you are a writer, that everything was worth it. The pressure to rush yourself, to rush your becoming, because if you don't have a glowing review or a big advance within two years, somehow you've blown it. And maybe a few of you will have those things quickly, if you don't already, and your professors at Columbia will be deeply thrilled. We want you all to write great things and be recognized for it. But if it doesn't happen right off the bat, I implore you not to panic. It's difficult to do in a world governed by speed, but I urge you to bide your time, to do your work, to keep honing it. Good writing does find a home. It finds an audience, and we are here. Your potential readers, we're all here, eagerly waiting for you to show us new ways into this ancient art. So while you can't control how or when your writing finds its home, you can decide how much you're going to try. Let the uncertainty of life be a source of energy for you. Let it reflect the importance of uncertainty in art. Finding out where those lines and sentences lead is the whole point. For by following them, you begin to learn what it is you are saying and how you are going to say it. And once you discover the nature of your utterance and how to guide it, you can go anywhere and say anything. Once you have some mastery, you can loosen up. That to me is the essence of this program learning how others have done this and how you can. You are well on your way, but the education continues as it does for all of us, even as you produce more and more astonishing work. And I believe you can and will astonish, write bold, surprising, brilliant poems and prose, any one of you, if, you're des if you desire it and have the patience and strength to flounder, to risk looking foolish, 
to squander everything, and if you miss, to throw your pages out and start from scratch. As I said, if we've done our job correctly, these prospects excite you. You are ravenous for them, because you will be in the act of composition, where time stands still, and everything not the case falls away. And what's better than that? I mean, human relationships are nice and all. <laughs> but really. <laughs> Meantime, enjoy this day. You deserve it. You are precisely not like the protagonist of one of my favorite Donald Bartlemy stories, The Dolt. In this dystopian fiction, a man wants to create literature, but can't pass the National Writer's Examination, which would certify him to do so. He's already failed several times, but his problem isn't the entire test. He always passes the oral section of the examination. He just can't handle the written part. <laughs> well, guess what? You've all passed the written part. But it's the last line of that story that has always stuck with me. Endings are elusive. Middles are nowhere to be found. But to begin, to begin, to begin. I think you all know the thrill and terror of starting out. It's a beautiful thing. So come on up here and get your fake diploma and begin. <laughs> Thank you, and now I would like to introduce, this is the writing program's manager of academic administration, Clarence Koo. Who will read the names of the 2019 MFA graduates in writing. William Acker. Sola Sar Augustine. Shoshana Akabis. Daphne Kate Palasi Andreades. Isabel Burden. Samuel Owen Carpenter. Claire Caracillo. Nifath Chaudhary. Sarah Jane Collins. Robert Crawford. Kelly Crisp. <laughs> Philip De Guzman. Alana Duncan. I know this one. Nathan Featheroff. Jean Kyung Frazier. Gabriela Garcia. Carolina Casabal. Evan Gorsman. Sasha Graffit. This is a good one. Michael Hanna. William Harrison Hill. Tig Hoy. Maria Fernanda Hong. Brian Huselton. Brady Jackson. Karishma Jobin Putra. Saray Jarrell Johnson. 
Daniel Kagan Kahns. Chloe Russell Kent. Kyle Quarry. Katya Kazbek. Katarina Lapole. Marie Lavina. CJ Lloyd. Daniel Lefferts. Corinne Lesh. This is a good one. Jack Lowry. Georgette Kulukundis Mallory. Jesse McNeil. Chris Molnar. Monica Christina Muniz Pedrogo. Aton Nation. Catherine Northington. Zishan Khan Patan. Paulina Pinsky. Mina Sechkin. <laughs> Melanie Shaw. That's a good one. Nick Smat. <laughs> Elizabeth Steiner. Jade Alexis Stewart. Liza St. James. Sarah Ann Margaret Swain. Ina Caroline Wallenberg. Coco Wilder. Miranda Wonder. Brian Lee Young. Ju An Yu. Lee Zhuang. Congratulations, all of you, class of 2019. Will the graduates please rise? Having completed the requirements for the Master of Fine Arts or Master of Arts, I now confer on you these degrees with all the rights and privileges thereto attached. We wish you great success and joy in your lives. May your spirits always be free to make and do the work close to your hearts. You are now our alumni and forever part of the School of the Arts, Columbia University in the City of New York, and the Columbia Alumni Association Congratulations, now let's party. Yeah.